plan to latch on to critical race theory. The Republicans are fanning the flames of a new culture war, claiming the teaching of critical race theory is a threat to our kids. The single most uh, important issue to them apparently right now is critical race theory. Who knew that was the threat to our republic? This, this is the signal that we're winning the war against critical race theory. I make the case that we shouldn't believe that anyone is inherently racist or that we should identify anyone as a racist. Because like a defeated animal, they are slowly backtracking, walking back their words and trying desperately to shift the narrative. Have you ever heard of any school that's teaching that anywhere? <laughs> I haven't. And, and, and indeed, I would speak out against that school if, if it was doing it. All because of you. Personally, tell a white kid, oh, the black people are all down to suppress. How do I have two medical degrees if I'm sitting here oppressed? You, black, white, Democrat, Republican, independent, you stood up against these evil ideas that quickly began to infiltrate our kids' schools. But the Marxists will be back. In fact, they're crawling all around us like cockroaches in every single institution we're desperately trying to preserve. So tonight, Using critical race theory, I'm going to expose the secret of Marxism. The tactics they use every single time and the methods they're using now. You just say whatever you want and then you back away from it and you yeah. dance around. To not so slowly now transform our nation into their dystopian dream. Tonight, Marxist methods debunking the left's lies about critical race theory. Hello, America. I just have to tell you, uh, there's nothing like starting a program off with a little bit of um, being talked down to by Barack Obama. Oh, I, critical race theory, like that's a big deal. Yes, sir, that's why I said you're a racist. No, that's not quite right. But he seems to have a deep-seated uh, uh, hatred for white people and the white culture. Critical race theory. I retract my apology. This is being fed, spoon fed to our kids and the left, they're masters at gaslighting. After you're a racist, next on the hit parade is you're a conspiracy theorist. They'll do anything to discredit anybody, even if it's absolutely true. I wanna show you Christopher Rufo. He's the editor at uh, City Journal who has exposed a lot of the worst examples of CRT. Rufo has been labeled a conspiracy theorist, a grifter, an opportunist. He's been accused of single-handedly creating a straw man that is critical race theory. But we know the truth. Uh, but really, uh, they just, they just want to com uh, commit their bad behavior without any kind of consequences at all. They want to make sure that they can get away with anything and they think that their lies still work. Don't listen to them when they try to backtrack away from critical race theory. They're doing what they always do, retreating when people call them out for their terrible ideas. Last month, President Obama said that only conservatives are concerned with CRT. There are certain right-wing uh, media venues, for example, that monetize what? and capitalize on stoking the fear and resentment of... Uh, a white population that is witnessing a changing America. Lo and behold, the, the single most uh, important issue to them apparently right now is critical race theory. Nah. Who knew <laughs> that that, <laughs> that was the threat to our republic? Why he's making me blush, I think he's talking about us. Here's a video of a 28-year-old Barack Obama in 1990. Look out, never seen this one before. Hugging Derrick Bell. Who's Derrick Bell? just the founder of critical race theory. He hasn't done it simply because of the excellence of his scholarship. Although his scholarship has opened up new vistas and new horizons and changed the standards of what legal writing is about. Mm. There you are, hugging it out. He speaks very warmly about a person who only conservatives care about. That's because Bell was Obama's mentor at Harvard. See where he gets the deep-seated hatred? 
Here's an article about the occasion from 2012, published by Slate, which is basically the journalistic version of AOC. Notice the line here about what's critical race theory and how crazy is it? Nearly a decade later and suddenly critical race theory is a racist obsession created by racist conservatives. We see the racist effects of it and criticize it and say, <laughs> you know, hey, this is pretty racist. And they say, well, you don't know the facts, man. What article or books have you read? Look, it's very clear. Um, you know, you could read uh, you could read Captain America and figure out that CRT is racist and CRT is just that. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt. So we dive into the text. But there's that's not enough for them either. They, they say you can't understand the text because you're inherently a racist. Like we need some sort of anti-racist decoder ring, which I believe Twinkie cereal promised us, and I have been digging at the bottom of the Twinkies. Oh, they're delicious. This is healthy. There's no decoder ring in this whole package. None. Where's my Marxist decoder ring? Huh? If I can't get it from the Twinkie Corporation, well, where are you going to get it? What they're saying is um, they can't fight fair. They can't hold reasonable conversations. Oh, these smell like Twinkies. Ooh, I'm ready for a date now. The ideas are so flimsy that they have to change all the rules of normal discourse. They just, they, they just look the other way and say, look, racist. So I want you to look at the way they've defended Nicole Hannah-Jones. Now, this is the New York Times staff writer who won the Pulitzer for her work on the 1619 Project. She was recently denied tenure at the University of North Carolina over accusations of being historically inaccurate. Well, that's a polite way of saying she's a big fat liar. I'm sorry, did I call her big? Instead of admitting defeat or God forbid, conducting a little self-examination like, am I a liar? She and her leftist cohorts have returned to the reliable villain of us. Or how about Patrice Cullors? She's the co-founder of BLM, who recently went on a $4 million real estate shopping spree. She's an avowed Marxist. Isn't that crazy? Am I a Marxist? I'm a lot of things. I do believe in Marxism. It's a philosophy that I learned really early on in my organizing career. Yeah, I don't think you really understand Marxism if you're out, you know, buying houses uh, through the capitalists. Anyway, the uh, four, the uh, condensed version of her four and a half minute response to a yes or no question was that, okay? Which is another leftist tactic, avoiding questions by boring us to tears with answers full of meaningless words, some of which they just make up. Meanwhile, they completely escape accountability. In this case, accountability for the fact that an avowed Marxist has violated the most important principles of Marxism, all while leading a radical Marxist organization that has overtaken nearly every aspect of our daily life. They've led riots in our cities and amassed millions of dollars that nobody's like, where did I put that $10 million? But who gets blamed for it? Who gets blamed for Kohler's hypocrisy? Yeah. You guessed it, it's us again. And, quote, the tradition of terror by white supremacists, end quote. Or they frame Culler's hypocrisy as, quote, a disruption to white supremacy. And not a total uh, contradiction and just flat out capitalist greed. Then there was the professor who recently gave a lecture at Yale titled, The Psychopathic Problem of the White Mind. <laughs> and in it, she describes fantasies she has of shooting people, white people, in the head multiple times. The Wall Street Journal ran a great editorial, editorial re recently about woke culture, in which the author pointed out, under the deep division in the country, certain prizes, Pulitzer, MacArthur grants, honorary degrees, go almost exclusively to people whose views are woke. Presidential medals in the humanities, in the arts, for freedom, are dictated by whether the president in office is woke or not. 
A perfect example of this is Ta Nahisi Coates. Now, Ta, I like to call him Ne. Um, he is the um, MacArthur Fellow. He is also the recipient of the National Book Award. He is a critical race theorist extraordinaire who has defined racism as, quote, the need to ascribe bone deep features to people and then humiliate, reduce, and destroy them. Gosh, that sounds almost like critical race theory, doesn't it? Golly gee, Wally, mom and dad are gonna be really upset about this when they get home. Now, like most leftists, he's as hypocritical as he is smug. By his own definition, he's a virulent racist, which seems to have been his objective with the Dr. Jordan Red Skull Peterson, a guy who just wants to use his decades of experience as a psychiatrist or psychologist to help people. Coates wrote an, uh, the issue 28 of the Captain America comic book. In it, the Nazi supervillain Red Skull is referred to as the new leader of the power elite who brainwashes young white men over the internet with his new theory of the world. Wow. That is a, a really bad and dishonest take on Jordan Peterson's message. But that's what these guys get. You don't see them asking me to write anything about Captain America, do you? No, 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 no. But they can, and they can get away with anything. The left says a lot of ridiculous stuff. And they have kind of a tenuous relationship with the truth. And as mentioned, lots and lots of power. So nobody speaks up, especially because Coates, who is untouchable, loves labeling people white supremacists. Uh, the fact that I'm criticizing him likely ruins any chances I had in the comic book industry or being his pal, which I have wanted to be his pal for so long. What a tragedy. Elsewhere, Coates is describes, uh, he describes conservatism as a movement steeped in white resentment. That's the way I would describe it, huh? In an essay for The Atlantic about the Civil War, he writes, White Americans finding easy comfort in nonviolence and the radical love of the civil rights movement must reckon with the unsettling fact that black people in this country achieve the rudiments of their freedom through the killing of whites. Now, I think you got that wrong. It was mainly white people killing white people to free black people. I just want to say, to be clear, whiteness and white supremacy, especially when used in the context of eradicating an entire race of people, are racist dog whistles. They are a good clue that the person speaking, or more often tweeting, is actually a virulent racist with a mind full of hate and violence themselves. It should alarm all of us to hear anyone speak like this, Yet, recent calls for white genocide have been mostly shrugged off. Ah, they don't mean it. Let me give you a little tip. Anytime somebody says, I'm going to kill you and all people like you, I think it's a good safety tip to believe them. Take them at their word. Hey, if they were lying, no big deal. If they were telling the truth, you'll be prepared. Here's a thought-provoking article which tells us, quote, white supremacy is a virus, like other viruses, will not die until there are no bodies left for it to infect. Oh, I think she's talking about me. Uh, which means the only way to stop it is to locate it, isolate it, extract it, and kill it. I guess a vaccine could work too, but we've had 400 years to develop one, so I wouldn't hold my breath. Oh, wow. How about some of these? These are great, too. Once again, notice that they invalidate our concerns by labeling uh, them as conspiracy theories. Or if they're extremely smug, they go with myth. I like that one. The Anti-Defamation -Def League, you know, comes out and says that the white genocide conspiracy is actually a creation of white supremacist conspiracy theorists. Another CRT grifter is Ibram X. Kendi, otherwise known as Henry Rogers. Uh, he bills himself as an anti-racist activist. Like Coates, he won a National Book Award. 
He made it on Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2020, which kind of hurts because I was one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, and I thought it meant something. His book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, is a critical race theory textbook. Like all other critical race theorists, he is just as hateful, just as cynical, and self-important as Coates. So, what's coming up next? I'm going to give you a great example of how the accusation conspiracy theory really doesn't mean anything. If anything, it's a conspiracy. All right, let me tell you about Rough Greens. Uh, My dog, Uno, loves Rough Greens. And I'm not kidding you. We used to have to hand feed this dog. And I'm like, Lord, please. What, really? This is the dog we have? We have to stand there and hand feed him. Or we would stand there. If If you get him to eat in the bowl, hey, that was a victory. But don't move. Because every time you would move, and I mean just a little bit, he would look at you, and then he'd lose his interest, and you'd have to start all over again. It was excruciating. Then I started putting rough greens uh, all over his food, and he started to eat it, and he loved it. I honestly don't care if it's dog heroin. I really don't care. Um, He likes it. He's eating. Now, here's the good thing. It's not dog heroin, Uh, so your dog's not shooting up in the bathroom in the middle of the night. Anyway, Uh, What it is is something that is chock full of vitamins and minerals and probiotics and omega oils. All the things that your dog needs and your wife is like, you got to have to my omega oil. All that stuff. I don't care about it. I just want it to taste good. My dog loved it. And my dog has actually changed. Now, uh, here's the thing. Your dog may not like it. My dog does. Dr. Dennis Black, he's the inventor of Rough Greens. He doesn't want that to be a reason not to give it a try because, you know, you don't want to buy a bag of something and then you're like, oh, great, my dog wouldn't eat it, and now I got a bag of this crap. So here's the deal. You get a free bag of Rough Greens. It's a little bag. You can try it out uh, and make sure that your dog likes it. Then if your dog likes it, then go to roughgreens.com slash back or call 833-GLEN33 and get a bag of Rough Greens. Wait until you see the difference in your dog. It's good stuff. Roughgreens.com. All right. So tonight I want to prepare you for the tactics that you are going to come up against. Uh, You're pretty familiar with, you're a racist. But it's still nice to know uh, what's coming your way when you're about to be ambushed and and what to care about, what not to care about. As usual, the left has booby-trapped and done everything to sabotage the possibility of listening to what we have to say about the state of America, let alone facing up to their own problems. So what is coming? How do they, do, what are the tactics? Well, one of the most successful ways they've done this is by constantly shifting the goalposts and changing the meaning of the words they use. I'm gonna give you a good example. Cultural Marxism which used to be an acceptable name for the Frankfurt School, also known as critical theory, the movement that critical race theory is largely based on. The basic idea is that critical theorists look at traditional Marxism, which is based on economic equality, and applied it to culture, hence cultural Marxism. Ideas like oppression, systematic racism, proto-fascism, commodity fetishism, and a slew of other made-up words and phrases that become leftist buzzwords. Now, part of the reason they did this is because, according to traditional Marxism, members of the Frankfurt School were the enemy, and they wanted the benefits of being oppressed. But that's a topic for another show. Regular old Marxism wasn't working because people were happy. That's why they had to go into the cultural cultural Marxism. Now, if you Google cultural Marxism, this is what you're going to get. A page for the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. It's categorized as part of a series on anti-Semitism and discrimination. The conspiracy theory basically claims that right-wing racists hate critical theory because conservatives hate Jews. I mean, I was telling all my Jewish friends when I was over in Israel receiving the Defender of Israel Award uh, from Benjamin Netanyahu, and I said, isn't it crazy how much we all hate Jews? <laughs> oh, what a, what a story to tell. Anyway, the conspiracy theory about this supposed conspiracy theory 
is about as wild as the Indiana Jones plotline involving Nazis and gun-obsessed villains. But look past the fact that the left is often incredibly anti-Semitic. The timing of this conspiracy theory is a little suspect. It's, let's just say, very sudden. Let me show you the cultural Marxism page, what it used to look like. Um, there it is. There it is. Now, this is from May 19th, 2014. It's an archive of the talk section for cultural Marxism. There was a lot of pushback from a handful of Wikipedia editors who felt like change, uh, like the change was political and a little bit suspect. The change didn't happen without resistance. An article in Psychology Today debunked the Wikipedia page as, quote, academic propaganda camouflaged as scholarship. Now, here are a few of the academic articles that Wikipedia uses as proof of cultural Marxism being a conspiracy theory. This one appeared in, and I'm not making this up, the Journal for Social Justice. The author uh, is an expert in critical theory and hate studies. Hate studies. Okay, let's go back to the Journal of Social Justice. I was looking for that journal. I couldn't find it anywhere. And it's not really a journal. It's more of a, I mean, have a look here. It's a uh, it's a pamphlet. It's circulated by the Transformative Studies Institute. Now, just to give you a taste of some of the other articles that have been published in the Journal of Social Justice, the April edition included one titled, Is Fat Queer? Parallels Between Weight Loss, Surgery, and Gender Transition. I think they're talking about me because I'm fat. On the website for Transformative Studies Institute, you can also donate because... It really wouldn't be a Marxist publication without them begging for money, right? Among the causes your donation will go to is activist training. Now, the Speakers Bureau section of the website tells you everything you need to know. All of the speakers are the exact same kind of activist academics we've been warning you about. The ones gunning for your children's minds right now. Here's one of their many publications called Revolt. In case you're wondering, it's a Marxist publication. Here's another example of the scholarly sources that Wikipedia uses as proof that cultural Marxism is a right-wing conspiracy theory. From Pacific Standard, about how Jordan Peterson is an anti-Semitic, alt-right fascist. Uh, the, uh, the author of the article, and you really can't make this up, uh, authored other lovely books such as Nazi Dreams, Films about fascism and bondage and, feti and feminism in Wonder Woman. Oh, man. That wasn't a waste of money when you went to school. It wasn't at all. No way. Those were important books to you. Here he is promoting activism and CRT in schools. White Americans have largely stopped seeing anti-racism as a major goal of educational policy. Instead... They've chosen to fix a uh, focus on maximizing their own choices and the success of their own children. <sighs> what monsters? So that should make uh, this guy kind of a dubious choice for writing a Wikipedia article about how cultural Marxism is a right wing conspiracy theory. Then the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory Wikipedia pages uh, rep uh, references this article by The Guardian. Cultural Marxism, a uniting theory for right-wingers who love to play the victim. Can I tell you something? If I hear another conservative just say, I'm the victim here, I'm the victim, oh, I'm oppressed. I mean, right? We've heard that from the Republicans. Never. How's that for some, pro for some projection there? that all of a sudden we're the ones saying we're oppressed. The story of cultural Marxism is also flexible. It can be tailored to fit with the obsessions of a range of right-wing actors, such as, it's one example of an idea from the extremes which has been mobilized by more mainstream figures and has dragged politics as a whole a little farther right. Oh boy, the Guardian nailed us on that one. 
Now, our press feeds into the conspiracy theory about cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. Of course, what would the far left be without the help of the Southern Poverty Law Center? Oh, well, they're great. They've devoted time and space debunking the anti-Semitic right-wing conspiracy known as cultural Marxism. Now, if you were just to go to Wikipedia and see that cultural Marxism is a right-wing anti-Semitic conspiracy theory being promoted by Jordan Peterson and pretty much any conservative who challenges Marxism, you'd probably have no idea that all of those claims are based on absolute far-left propaganda made by professional Marxist activists. And I only gave you a brief glimpse into what's going on behind the scenes on that one, but that's how it always works. What, the, what matters to the left is winning at all cost, and they don't care what they have to say or do. And they have control of our media, academia, and culture. And they use one of their most annoying tactics, uh, indignant denial. The more glaring the lie, the more casual. <laughs> now the Republicans are thinking that critical race theory is a problem. Who knew? Oh. This is the same for Antifa. They're, they're, they were trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> they're just a group of kids that just really want some justice. They've tried to act for months now, like last summer's riots never happened. They weaponize ideas, concepts, theories, and most of all, they weaponize words. Okay, so don't use the term cultural Marxism anymore. You can say Marxist cultural analysis, but not cultural Marxism. Fine. That's not the point. The point is we are being accused of terrible things by people who are actually doing terrible things. So put your blinders on. They're just a spoiled child playing a game. They make up the rules as they go. And that's how they think they will always win. But in their arrogance, they will lose. Tonight, next, I'm going to show you one of the principles they use to justify their behavior. All right. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I have in my pocket a Wonka bar. This is Oompa Loompas made this. Uh, this is going to be out on the market next week. And it is the most delicious candy bar you ever have. It's, it, this is Rocky Road. The marshmallows taste like marshmallows. And the chocolate tastes like chocolate. And the Snoz Wanglers taste like Snoz Wanglers. Bill Barb, my wife says, it's a protein bar. It's got low calories, 120 calories. It's good for you. And I'm like, then why am I eating it, honey? Really? Why am I eating it? It's good for you. Yeah. This tastes like Rocky Road ice cream. It's a new flavor, and it is coming out next week. Protein bar, candy bar. Get a box. You're going to love them. Beck 15, go to Built. Dot com. Use the promo code BEC15. You'll save 15% off your first order. Promo code BEC15 at Built.com. Mmm, snoz wanglers. Did anybody think when you heard that the Biden administration said they were going to go door to door to talk about vaccines, did anybody else think, my gosh, our administration has fully become community organizers? But where does that come from? I want to take the breadcrumb trail back a little further because there's one concept that you really need to know. It's the secret of Marxism. It's called praxis. It is the idea, praxis, and it explains everything about Marxists. It is the idea that motivates everything they do. The mission is activism, community organizing. They use theory for activism. They use art for activism. They inject it into sports, movies, leisure time. Have you noticed everything is about politics? That's praxism. That's, that's what they do. Every aspect of life, according to Karl Marx and Marxists, it must pay homage to praxis. It's an important word for you to remember. Praxis. Now you're going to start seeing it everywhere. 
It's one of the left's favorite buzzwords now. It's a dog whistle for him. Remember, I showed you the bogus Journal of Social Justice. Okay, it bills itself as, quote, the flagship journal of critical theory and praxis theory in action. See, their goal is to, quote, establish a tuition-free graduate school granting accredited PhDs and MA degrees to foster interdisciplinary research that will bridge theory with praxis, otherwise known as action, and encourage community involvement to alleviate social problems and promote social justice. It, it basically expresses Marx's mission. He said philosophers have, have hereto only interpreted the word uh, or the world in various ways. And the point is to change it. Praxis is action. It's based on Aristotle's three modes of being. There was thinking, there was making, and then there was doing. It was praxis. In 1938, a Polish philosopher with, uh, sorry, 1838, a Polish philosopher whose name I can't, I mean, look at that name. I'm never going to be able to, never going to be able to pronounce it. He was one of the first intellectuals to use the modern meaning of the word, which he defined as action-oriented towards changing society. 19th century, another major socialist described Marxism as the philosophy of praxis. The idea here is that humans always need political guidance. This was Marx's arrogance. He thought he had the answers that nobody else could see. The arrogance clearly served him well. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called Marxism. It'd be called, I don't know, Bobism or any of the other socialist movements that have failed to do anything. Um, but if you want to see praxis in action, look to colleges. Now, this is really important. It's how they've turned academia into instruments of social engineering. They use it in college to change society. This is why they're after our children now. Not colleges only. Now our little children. They are making activists. Why? Because that's Marxism. The purpose is no longer educational. It's social. They're using the classrooms to cause social change. The most important takeaway from tonight's show is whatever is happening on campuses right now is what is going to play out through the rest of society in about 30 years. We're seeing it right now with critical race theory. It started on the campus, started in the classroom, and I don't want your children to be yet another victim of the cultural warfare of a nightmare that seems like will never end. But that's what's coming because of praxis. For instance, it is undeniable that the social science, sciences lean overwhelmingly left, right? Universities are full of leftist professors and more and more often leftist administrators. We know that the left is driven by hypocrisy. We know that they manipulatively use race to get power. But do any of them actually believe what they say? We know the answer, but once again, let's use some proof to clarify that answer. A recent study found that 78.2% of the academic departments in this sample have either zero Republicans or so few as to make no difference. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, they silence anybody who disagrees with them. And it also means that your values are nowhere to be found on any campus. And with praxis, professors aren't teaching they are training new activists. So universities don't supply knowledge anymore. They supply the illusion of equality or equity. They have created a trap for their own benefit, the education trap. They have, they have stopped all social mobility. More import importantly, who are they looking to for their moral guidance? Who are their heroes, objectively? It would have to be Michael Foucault. He is a French philosopher from the 1960s who popularized many of the terrible ideas that we're now faced with on a daily basis, including stuff like gender is a social construct. How many times have you heard that from somebody with a nose ring? And institutions need to be destroyed. A colleague of Foucault uh, claimed that at the time of his death, he was perhaps the, most, uh, the single most famous intellectual in the world. 
Now let's skip ahead. 20, uh, 2007, content analysis by the Institute for Scientific Information determined Foucault to be the single most cited scholar in the humanities. So your kids take anything in the humanities, done. In 2016, a London School of Economics content analysis found that Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish and the History of Sexuality ranked in the 25 most cited books in the social sciences of all time. To more recent evolutions of critical theory, Foucault has been elevated to start uh, to the uh, to the to the really the platform of a sainthood. You have fat studies, critical race theory, queer theory, his social constructionism. It's a big reason why we we've heard so much about how sexuality is a social construct, and we're we're debating all of these things that are insane. Came from this guy. But as a sociologist, uh, Daniel Zamora observed, Foucault has become an untouchable figure within part of the radical left. Modern feminist theory has largely Marxist basis, but the other part of its foundation comes from this guy, Foucault. The idea of systematic racism or systemic racism, Foucault. He came up with the idea of systemic issues. Social constructs, Foucault. The idea of social constructionism was the direct challenge to the idea of objective truth. There is no truth, Foucault. Critical theory founded on Marxist thought. So why is this a problem? And what does he have to do with anything? You need to know he's a hero to many. Michael Foucault was a pedophile, openly, and might have intentionally spread AIDS as a kind of BDSM, and may have also been an actual racist. I mean, like, that's his biggest crime. Despite uh, his critiques of power and colonialism, Foucault is alleged to have intentionally chosen Tunisian boys between eight and 10 years old because he knew they'd never be able to do anything about it. He was an open pedophile. A former friend of Foucault, who recently spoke about his behavior, said Foucault would not have dared do it in France because there is a colonial dimension there, white imperialism. Oh, white imperialism, you mean we don't let people have sex with kids? Call me a white imperialist then. We, we used to say that all you have to do is instill good values into your kids. So when they get to college, they'll avoid the culture of woke, the people who hate you and your values, and the people actively trying to erase you out of existence. But that's not true anymore. We have to use the same approach that they use with their cult followers. When you send your kids to college, you need to let your children know that they are about to enter the culture wars. They're about to enter a dark, dark world, a world that at first may seem enticing, but ultimately is a nightmare and an affront to everything that builds society. The cult spinsters who see your children as collateral damage in their war against America. That's how they see them, in an all-out destruction of your most important values. And on top of it all, they expect you to pay for it, tens of thousands of dollars. Why? Are we funding this? They don't give a damn about your life. They don't give a damn about your child's life. They don't give a damn about a black child, brown child, yellow child. Why? They don't care. They have been trained to hate the family, to think of marriage as legal prostitution, to see life itself as nothing. They want to take your property. They want to hawk all your things. You can find all of it throughout Marxist writing. Don't let the cultists tell you otherwise. Don't let the media tell you otherwise. If they mock and harass you, fine. They did that to others. They've done that to the best of people. They did that to Jesus, fine, whatever. By the way, legal prostitution is how Marx and Engels referred to marriage. I could give you an, an hour, two hours, spend all this time giving you just examples of Marx's hatred for life and their fellow human beings, but you already see it. 
If you want a true individual, a true look at Marxism, I want you to see what praxis really looks like. Picture thousands of skulls and femurs and ribs and spines piled on a hillside. Imagine a world where life doesn't matter. Freedom can't survive and doesn't exist. Where the truth has been abandoned and mocked and so has God. Somewhere that denies its people's souls, their individuality, their happiness. Somewhere way too hostile for anyone to survive. That's what Marxism is. And that is not hyperbole. After the break, I want to bring in a constitutional lawyer and debunk the lie that is now being spread that this is just a harmless legal theory. No, it's not. You'll understand next. If you are one of the millions of Americans who suffer every day from pain, I want you to listen up. There is hope, and it comes in the form of Relief Factor. Every day I see testimonials of people who have tried Relief Factor for their pain and gotten their life back, and I know it can happen firsthand because that's me. A couple of years ago, I would have been having conversations before we went on the air to say, make sure you don't shoot my hands, they're shaking too much. Don't make sure you shoot my hands because they're probably gnarled up. I don't have to do that now. This is relief factor. It, I don't know how it works. I don't care. I know it's all natural, uh, and it works for about 70% of the people who try it. So please try it now. Relief factor at relieffactor.com. Call 800-500-8384, relieffactor.com. All right, I want to bring in a guy who is a constitutional uh, lawyer, an opinion editor at Newsweek. Do not hold that against him. He's a friend of the program and uh, one of the clearest thinkers on CRT. He has just uh, written an article and he concludes by saying, Banning CRT is neither coercive nor liberty infringing. Rather, it is prudent and a necessary first step to salvaging a fractious nation teetering on the brink of collapse. He's always a... A ray of sunshine. Please, please welcome Josh Hammer. <laughs> Hi, Josh. Glenn, great to see you. Thanks good, for having me on. Good to see you. Um, by the way, did you, do the people at Newsweek know that you know me and we agree on a lot of <laughs> stuff? Because I don't know how you got that. Um, let me, um, uh, let, let's, let's start with the, the argument that this is just an obscure legal theory and nobody pays attention to it. It's nothing. Right. So, I mean, whatever merit that may or may not have had, I mean, Chris Rufo, you know, who is kind of like doing yeoman's work right now, is kind of leading yeah. this national crusade against critical race theory. I mean, he had a recent article at the New York Post and one in City Journal, uh, where he's an editor as well. The, the leader or excuse, the National Education Association, one of the major kind of public teachers unions in America, recently met and they determined what their priorities are for this coming year. And the NEA expressly talked about promoting critical race theory in the classroom. So that if that is out. I mean, like whatever ta- whatever merit that may or may right. not have had, you know, cr- critical theory goes back to the Frankfurt School. It quite literally mm-hmm. is Marxist in origin. Mm-hmm. But whatever. You know, they, they said for a while it was it was limited to the to the academy to higher education. Yeah. That, that ship is so obviously sailed at this point, though. Like we, we literally see what's happening is it, we're not idiots, Glenn. Okay, so then the the next uh, the next thing would be is that there's nothing to worry about. I mean, it's it's not a big deal. It's a it's a benign academic concept. Uh, anyone who questions it is a right wing extremist uh, driven by racial resentment, which I really like. Um, and they say that any ban against it is just a, a trick of the right trying to get you to not talk about Martin Luther King. Yeah, so the term that I think I use in, in that column is I, I, I call it a botted Manly fallacy or, or, or modern Bailey fallacy, excuse me. It, it literally just, it's basically just a classic liberal bait and switch is, what, is what's actually going on here. They say that, oh, don't worry about it. We, you know, we, we just want to talk about racism and Jim Crow and slavery. But – you know, every bill should be assessed on its own. Every piece of legislation, every piece of regulation has to be assessed individually. But no one who like opposes CRT and wants to actually ban it is seeking to ban a discussion of the various horrors that have happened in American history, right. like slavery, like like Jim Crow and so forth. All we are trying to do, those of us who want to actually ban this racial ideology from the classroom, are we are trying to ban 
teachers telling white children that they should feel guilty because they are white and right. white people 150 years ago in certain locations did some very bad things. Right. That is what we're trying to ban here. We're not we're not trying to say don't talk about slavery. It's just a lie. It's a bait and switch. I have I have probably one of the biggest, you know, there's one of the biggest collections of really bad stuff that America did because I think it's important to teach that. You have to know that side of your country so you're not surprised by it and you know exactly who we are, warts and all. Um, you, you make a really good case and there's a debate on whether or not we should ban this or not. Um, I don't think we should ban talking about it, but, but the idea that we would teach it and be an advocate for it. We, we, we are clear that we don't teach n the philosophy of the Nazis and go in right. and become an advocate for that. Same thing used to be for communism. This is poison and we shouldn't, we can talk about it, but we should not advocate for it. Agree or disagree? Yeah, you know, there's this notion that the public school classroom, and that's where, that, that's primarily what we're talking about here, yeah. right, is we're talking mostly about the public school classroom. There's this notion that some people are saying that it's kind of like a, you know, an Enlightenment 18th century marketplace of ideas, right? They're going to quote John Locke and Voltaire and all these great <laughs> Enlightenment thinkers. Right. That is not what a public school classroom is. Public schools are, are run by – my mother is a public school teacher, by the way, so I, I speak from what I know on this. Public schools are government functionaries. They are run by governments. And, you know, as Chris Rufu, who I mentioned earlier, said in one of his recent pieces, the First Amendment exists to protect citizens from the government, not to protect the government. And here we mean public school teachers from citizens. It is our duty. It, it, it is our, our lowercase our Republican duty to exercise responsibility, oversight and governance of the government. And one of the ways to do that at the state level, going back to the American founding for hundreds of years, quite literally, has been to say that state education curricula should or should not contain certain ideologies. I mean, the same people that are saying that teachers have a First Amendment right to tell white children that they are ipso facto racist simply due to the fact they are white. I mean, if they're going to be intellectually consistent here, they should say that you have a First Amendment right to preach Holocaust denial, right? I mean, it's, it's the same argument. It you, quite you literally could, is the same argument. You could, you should be the first to say that person has a right to pray at the beginning of, of class every day and, and say whatever they want, yet they don't. There's no intellectual honesty. Um, we could talk uh, for a long time. Uh, best of luck um, at uh, Newsweek. Thank you so much for being with us today. Josh Hammer, back in just a minute. Hopefully something I said tonight um, stirred something in you and you will want to go and learn more. As always, don't take my word for things. Do your own homework. That's the only way you own that information. And right now, we have to know exactly what we believe and why and, and stand for it. We'll see you tomorrow on the radio. From Dallas, good night.